And welcome to the Reason and Theology Show, everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, joined by Louis Dizon, Dr. Khalil Andani. And we're doing a second in our uh, discussion here between a Muslim and a Catholic. Uh, first of all, gentlemen, let me welcome y'all to the show. First, how are you, Dr. Andani? I'm good. Uh, I'm glad that we're in the uh, holiday break. Uh, this term for all professors everywhere and students too was stressful. Uh, but uh, I'm happy uh, how everybody at different educational institutions sort of pulled through, prioritized safety, students still performed really well. Uh, Excellent. Well, you know, and it's good to have you back on. You were really, really good guest, very, um, very informative when it comes to understanding Islam. And I, I thought you were very, very charitable. So I look forward to this discussion uh, with uh, Lewis. Lewis, how are you? Oh, I'm doing well. Um, you know, I've been spending the better part of the month, like preparing my presentations for this particular episode. So, you know, it should be good. Yeah. And, and of course, we're going to be talking about a couple different topics here, the divinity of Jesus and, if time permits, the crucifixion of Christ. And what we're going to do is, Lewis, you're going to start us out Give, your, give us your understanding as a Catholic of the divinity of Jesus, and then I'm going to pass it to Dr. Andani, who is going to respond. Um, and then y'all can do a little bit of back and forth if y'all want, and then we'll move to the next topic, you know, time permitting. And uh, I think you're, um, you're going to be sharing a stream, or I'm sorry, a presentation. Is that right? Yep. Can you see the slides? See a nativity scene. Is yes. That right? Yes. I okay. figured because we are in the octave of Christmas, I would begin my presentation with a little nativity scene that I pulled from Google Image Search. Um, now you know the now Christmas is a very important time of the year for Christians because this is when we celebrate the birth of Christ, and the birth of Christ is a very important event in Christian theology. This is what we refer to as the incarnation. This is um, God coming in the flesh, according to our belief. So that little baby um, that is born in the manger is God himself from what we do. And this is something that has been the subject of a lot of um, discussion and of course debate as well and the culmination of that uh, debate are the great creeds that all christians recite so i want to begin by sh uh, talking about by showing you an excerpt from the nicene creed which is uh, accepted by almost all the major denominations of christianity and it gives you a summary of what we believe regarding the person of jesus so it states, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten from the Father, uh, of, of the substance of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. Uh, both which, we, I think the, okay, so you get the idea here that this uh, creed tells us that Jesus is, actually very God of very God, and that he's of the same substance as the Father. And this is the version that was formalized in the Council of uh, Constantinople. But in the original version in Nicaea, there was actually an extra clause that was omitted. Um, and it was a response to the statements made by Arius in the um, controversy that was happening during that time. And it said in that clause, it says, but those who say there was a time when he was not, and he was not before he was made, and he was made out of nothing, or he is of another substance or essence, or the Son of God is created or changeable or alterable, uh, they are condemned by the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. So here you have the line in the sand, so to speak, of where exactly um, the bounds are for what are acceptable for Christians to believe or not. And... This comes at the head of a long series of developments, but a lot of the ideas that come to form uh, Christian views about God actually have their origins in earlier writings. 
Like even before Nicaea, you already had many of the early church fathers referring to Jesus as God. So an example of this would be St. Ignatius of Antioch, who lived around the early second century. So in quite a few places in his epistles, he refers to Jesus Christ as God. And here are just a few of the examples that I've called from his writings. Um, so he doesn't really you know, expound on, you know, a, a theory of how the humanity and the divinity of Christ um, uh, cohere with each other. He just straightforwardly refers to Jesus as God. Um, so this is an idea that is already like assumed, if not like explained in detail. Um, and a little further in history, you have the um, church writer Tertullian who uh, says that Jesus Christ is both man and God. Here we have a little bit more detail. Uh, he refers to him as having two substances. So in one of his writings, he says, the origins of both his substances display him as man and as God, from the one born and from the other not born. So even though this is still a long ways off before Nicaea, a lot of the ideas that would later become Nicene Orthodoxy are already um, taking root here. And, and then of course, he says the same thing in his writings against Praxius, who was an early proponent of what is known as the uh, modalist heresy or civilian heresy, which denies a distinction between the three persons. So here he affirms the distinction between the Father and the Son, and while at the same time affirming that they are both divine. So these are all ideas that we see uh, in the early church, but where do these ideas come from? Did they are they a post? like post-apostolic development? Do they go all the way back to Jesus Christ? This is one of those things that is, of course, a source of contention among people who debate this, you know, um, especially if you're talking about debates between Christians and Muslims, but also um, between Christians and various secular academic scholars, some of whom uh, think that this is a later development. Um, Bart Ehrman comes to mind as someone who wrote a book talking about how this was something that developed late. Against this, there are a number of scholars who actually do believe that this high Christology where Jesus is seen as a divine figure emerges fairly early on. Uh, an example of this is Martin Hengel, who in his work Between Jesus and Paul, asserts that most of the key do developments happened right around the very beginning of the Christian movement. So he says this, quote, in essentials, more happened in Christology within these few years between Jesus' death and writing of Paul's epistles than the whole subsequent 700 years of church history. So Martin Hengel is someone who believes that the core ideas had already uh, taken root right at the very beginning. And Larry Hurtado, another New Testament scholar, agrees with this. He says that the earliest devotion to Jesus as divine is best understood as a remarkable innovation within and as a novel expression of the monotheistic piety characteristic of some Second Temple Jewish tradition. So according to Larry Hurtado, a lot of these ideas are already latent in the background in which Jesus and the early apostles um, grew up in. And finally, we have the Jewish scholar, Daniel Boyarin, who believes that a lot of those ideas were already well developed uh, in Second Temple Judaism. So his claim is something that is much stronger than what a lot of people uh, would say, but I think it is worth noting. So he says this, quote, Many Israelites at the time of Jesus were expecting a Messiah who would be divine and come to earth in the form of a human. Thus the basic underlying thoughts from which both the Trinity and the Incarnation grew are there in the very world into which Jesus was born, unquote. But do we see evidence of this in the uh, New Testament itself? Now, I don't want to go into too much detail about the New Testament evidence for the divinity of Jesus because that would be an entire um, lengthy presentation in and of itself, but I just want to mention a few uh, pieces of evidence. So we have explicit references to Jesus as God, um, and I can think of at least six different places where um, 
the word theos uh, is used in reference to Jesus. So you have John 1, 1, John 20, 28, Romans 9, 5, Titus 2, verse 13, 2 Peter 1, 1, and then 1 John 5, 20. So here we have that term being used um, in reference to Jesus. And in fact, um, it's generally accepted even among those who deny the divinity of Jesus that um, Jesus is in some sense a theos. Like if you've ever spoken to Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, which are, uh, you know, a sect that uh, grew off of Christianity but denies the deity of Christ, they would say something along the lines of, well, Jesus could be referred to as a mighty God with a small g, but, you know, they would distinguish between Jesus as a small g God and Jesus as a big g, you know, God, as in the one who created all things, which is why this is just part of a much broader tapestry of biblical evidence. And um, the evidence can best be summarized with an acronym, which um, I got from a book that was written by Robert Bowman called um, Putting Jesus in His Place, The Case for the Divinity of Christ. So he sees the evidence for Jesus' divinity as falling into five categories, um, which are um, abbreviated by the acronym HANDS. So in short, Jesus shares the honors due only to God. Jesus shares the attributes of God. Jesus shares the names that are used of God. And Jesus shares in the deeds that only God can do. And then finally, Jesus shares the seat of God. That is to say, Jesus sits on God's throne. So taken together, all of these uh, lines of evidence um, uh, come together to create a cumulative case for the divinity of Jesus as presented in the scriptures. And all of subsequent church history has basically been um, Christians looking at these texts, pondering what their significance is, and trying to um, give a rational explanation for how it is that Jesus can be both divine and human at the same time. So that is basically it um, for, sorry, that's the, for the next part of the presentation, but that's basically it for me with regards to the um, person of Jesus from a Christian perspective. Dr. Andani, if you want to take it from there. Sure. Uh, before I go, Lewis, I want to ask a couple of clarification questions. Can I do that? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so the, the, the first question I had was, uh, would your position, because I know scholars debate this. I, I mean, there's even a debate sort of ongoing mm -hmm. among Christian scholars uh, between Dunn and Hurtado and N.T. Wright and others um, as to sort of what's the timeline for Jesus being seen as divine? So is your position personally, if you have a position, uh, is your position that Jesus claims explicit divinity in his own life and then therefore his audience mm -hmm. would have understood him to be claiming to be uh, fully yes, that God? Would, be the would that be your would position? Take, I think that, you know, um, if we assume that the writers of the four Gospels actually transmitted to us the um, words of Jesus Christ, and I know there are some people who would debate that, then it's very hard to escape that conclusion. In fact, just going by the Gospel of Mark, the very thing that gets Jesus condemned by the Sanhedrin was him making this very claim for himself. Uh, are you referring to the Son of Man coming yes, on that the one. right? In the Mark right chapter 14, verses 60 to 62. Okay, so, so that, that referring to Daniel's yeah. prophecy, is that correct? Yes. Okay, uh, the second question I had was um, this idea of, you know, the New Testament uh, does not speak of natures or substances or any of that, right? Basically right. what we find in the later creeds or even the developed theologies. So without, without this very, this conceptual f framework that you find later, um, how would a sort of how would a Jewish monotheist 
Second Temple Jewish monotheist uh, contemporary with Jesus, how would they have understood like conceptually what it meant for Jesus to be God when you don't, when they're not thinking in terms of same substances and eternally begotten and things like that? Or I know maybe we don't know, but I just thought I'd ask. I question. think, yeah, I think the evidence is pretty fragmentary in that regard. Which is, which is why I showed you, for example, the early church fathers might, will use this language, but then, um, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find them actually unpacking in detail what exactly they mean when they say this. Uh, it's like, you know, it's an idea that they just, you know, it was already uh, assumed in their thinking. You know, the, they don't use um, the later developed language because the controversies that required them to clarify what exactly they were uh, thinking had not arisen yet. And, you know, the, the way theology develops is there would be debates, and debates are when you're forced to uh, set your position in stone. Okay, great. Well, uh, I guess I can sort of, uh, I'll, I'll go now. So, um, I'm going to share a response to Lewis, and uh, so I'm going to put this up here, and I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let's see here, share screen. Okay. All right, so good, people can see this. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm going to respond to what Lewis has shared, and most of these are dialogues, as people know, get into a whole polemics thing, right? So Lewis has shown us from a Christian perspective, the, I would say, the scriptural grounds for the divinity of Jesus. And, and often what we see is uh, the other side trying to sort of disprove, disprove that. Um, my, my purpose is not to, to disprove anything. Uh, I'm, this is, you can consider this, this is, I'm going to give an academic response. Uh, what my response is going to do is I'm going to share sort of a few observations of my own from the New Testament, uh, but I'm not going to really interpret them theologically one way or another. Uh, the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put into context what the Quran has to say about Jesus. Uh, it's very important that we understand that the, the theological and literary context of the Quran before we actually read what it says. Uh, and I'm going to do that because there's often what I hear in different circles is, oh, the Quran, the Quran is sort of coming 600 years later uh, from a completely different context that somehow is removed from Jewish and Christian debates. And, and it's actually quite the opposite. Uh, so that's the second thing I'm going to do. And the third thing I'm going to do is, rather than trying to refute anything Lewis has said, because that's not why I'm here, I'm going to present some perspectives from within the Islamic tradition, uh, drawing on both the Quran and some later mystical Shi'i and mystical Sufi ideas about the nature of prophets in general, which I think will provide uh, not a not a match for what I want to provide a Muslim analog to the Christian beliefs of the divinity of Jesus. So those are the three things I'm going to do. Uh, and I might sort of go through this fast because I don't want to take up all the time, but that's my point. I'm not here to, to debate anybody. I, I don't participate in, in theological debates. Uh, I am interested in academic dialogue and that's why, uh, you know, I dialogue with somebody like Lewis, as opposed to, you know, a professional debater, because I'm not a debater myself. So if there, if it looks like in my presentation that I'm disagreeing with Lewis, um, what I'm rather trying to do is I'm trying to sort of provide a sort of diversity of perspectives. Uh, but I leave it up to, to those who are watching to sort of you choose the perspectives that seem to make sense to you. So uh, let me begin then. Uh, so here's how I go about teaching a university classroom. Uh, the fact that we may disagree on who's right and who's wrong, but one historical fact is that today and even a thousand years ago and 2000 years ago, there were 
there was a diversity of beliefs about who Jesus is. Uh, now we can, uh, people will take a position and say this one is right and this one is wrong. But as an educator, I'm very interested in documenting the diversity of Christologies uh, and giving some of these these positions there do to a, to a learning audience. So here's how I frame it, and you don't have to agree with me, but this is my framing. So from a looking at looking back today, um, we can begin with the idea that there is Jesus of Nazareth, whoever he is. I think everybody, agree, well, besides some skeptics, but I think everyone agrees that there certainly was Jesus of Nazareth, the person of Jesus of Nazareth in, in reality, whoever he was. And then what we have is then we have interpretations of this Jesus of Nazareth. So interpretations are based on different types of data, different types of perspectives, different types of investigation. So one interpretation of Jesus of Nazareth, one set of claims on who he is, is what I, will call, I would call historical Jesus. Uh, and that's basically the type of Jesus that historians will reconstruct based on interpreting data through what people generally acknowledge to be a historical method, right? And that you find in modern academia. Uh, everyone likes to mention Bart Ehrman, but Bart Ehrman is one of these scholars. James Tabor is another scholar. Richard Bachman is another scholar. James Dunn is one of those scholars, N.T. Wright. Uh, you have believing Christians who are doing this research and you have, you know, non-believers. And there's a great debate on who the historical Jesus was and what he claimed to be, but I think there is near consensus, and Lewis, you can correct me, you might know better. I think there's near consensus that the historical Jesus, whoever else he was, he claims to be the Messiah of Israel, and he also claims to be an apocalyptic prophet of Israel. Now, he could be more than that, but I think most historians will agree on these things about him. Uh, and we can add to that that he was crucified. So I would say that's one perspective, the historical Jesus perspective. Uh, again, I, I'm, I'm pointing this out as an educator, because uh, when I teach classes, I have to also teach the historical Jesus perspective. Then I would say that another perspective, another set of claims to the reality of Jesus would be Jesus of faith. And by faith, I don't mean blind faith. I don't mean claims without evidence. Faith, by faith, I mean a religious uh, an interpretation that's situated within a religious worldview, a religious framework that includes uh, ideas of God, cosmos, human nature, uh, and a particular way of reading reading scripture. And then under Jesus of faith, what we find, even if you go back to the first century, uh, you find different Christologies among different groups. And now, of course, every group will claim that they're correct, and I'm not here to tell you who's correct, but I want to point out the fact of this. So you do have uh, what some scholars have called a Jewish Christian idea of Jesus, and there's a debate on, you know, whether it's early or whether it's late, but it has been associated uh, with the group known as the uh, Ebionites, uh, who claim that their teaching is a first century teaching, going back to James, the brother of Jesus. Now, Lewis, you'll obviously you'll disagree, but I'm just pointing out the fact that this perspective is there. Then we have the Gnostic Jesus, uh, which I won't get into. I assume many of the audience know uh, the Gnostic view of Jesus, but Lewis, you can clarify that maybe later. Uh, then there is what I call the Christian Jesus. And the Christian Jesus as time develops, there is no one view of the Christian Jesus, but we have several views. Uh, one I would call the uh, Chalcedonian view of Jesus, which is a certain claim to the Christian Jesus, uh, the Miaphysite view or the Monophysite view. And then there are other views. Uh, even today, people are coming up with different views. So uh, William Lane Craig's view, which is Neo-Apollinarian, I believe, uh, Keith Ward has a certain view. Uh, those would all be Christian, technically, uh, but they seem to depart in some ways from the uh, Chalcedonian or Monophysite views. Uh, you could add the Nestorians in here as well. So my point is that you have a diversity of Christologies, and, and it may be that Lu what Lewis shared with us uh, is, com is the correct one. Uh, that's not my purpose here to, to question, though. Now, I want to say at the outset that the Quranic Jesus should be seen as part of this framework. And the reason for that is 
the Quranic Jesus, if you sort of look at it in continuity with all these different Christologies developing and, and emerging and debating, the Quranic Jesus actually fits right in. Uh, what the Quran is doing is it is like many other authors and scholars and theologians, uh, there's a whole genre, of, for example, of sort of retelling the Bible. Uh, the Book of Jubilees, for example, is almost like a retelling uh, of Genesis uh, and Exodus, for example. So in this genre of sort of retellings of the Bible, what the Quran is doing is the Quran is offering a retelling of who Jesus is from a theological perspective, drawing very much on the Jewish and Christian post-biblical traditions that were prevalent at that time, such as, you know, the Proto-Evangelium of James, for example, or the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, which was uh, translated and circulating in Arabic. These texts, although today's Christians would say, oh, this is all, you know, heretical stuff, um, the Proto-Evangelium of James and the story that it has of Mary in, in the Byzantine Empire was actually quite influential, for example. So that's what the Quran is doing. And we, you may think the Quran is wrong, but the Quran is part of this conversation. So that's the first thing I want to say, that we have this sort of framework. Uh, the next thing I want to say is that there is material in the Bible that many historical Jesus scholars believe is reliable. Uh, even the most skeptical historical Jesus scholars, those who believe he existed, but even the skeptical ones believe that there is material in the Bible, in the Gospels, that is reliable historically. Uh, and some of that material is the material where Jesus is called a prophet, right? Uh, and again, I'm not making the point here that therefore what Lewis said is wrong, because actually Christians... I think creedally Christians are supposed to believe that Jesus also was a prophet. So you do have this material uh, in the New Testament, and I've highlighted some of it here from the actual text. Uh, and here, for example, uh, just as an example of what I'm saying, because I'm not a New Testament scholar myself, and I don't want to speak from my own authority, but here we have N.T. Wright. Uh, you must all know M.T. Wright or Tom Wright. And N.T. Wright tells us here, that referring to this prophet material, he says that, you know, the early church is highly unlikely to have invented uh, many sayings scattered throughout the Gospels, which called Jesus a prophet. And as a historian, N.T. Wright, and he's not alone in this, but N.T. Wright says that I suggest that Jesus was seen as and saw himself as a prophet. Uh, he goes on to talk about how it would be uh, Jesus would have been seen as a prophet like the prophets of old coming to Israel with the word from her covenant God. So my only point here is that uh, from a historical perspective, it, it is not a surprising claim to hear uh, that Jesus was a prophet. Uh, we should not be surprised at this. Uh, there's probably good historical basis for thinking that he called himself a prophet uh, and people externally saw him as a prophet. Uh, and again, Christians would not really, I, I mean, I can't speak for Christians, but I don't think a Christian would really disagree with the prophetic role of Jesus. They would probably say that, yes, he's also more than that. But I just want to point that out. Uh, the other, um, you know, this is just another reference for people. Uh, I won't read the whole quote out, but this is William R. Herzog, who uh, who was a, a, new t a professor of New Testament. And he actually makes the, the very same point. Uh, that N.T. Wright and many other scholars make. So he also says that Jesus was perceived to be a prophet. He was called, it was likely he was called a prophet in his lifetime. Uh, and, and there are other scholars. I think Bart Ehrman, even Bart Ehrman calls Jesus an apocalyptic prophet. Uh, E.P. Sanders also does the same. So there is some some basis for the, the, later, the later Quranic claim, which says Jesus is a prophet of God, that claim is still very much informed by biblical material. It is an interpretation of the biblical material, but it has some basis. Uh, the other thing I wanted to, to take note of, and, and this is not, again, I'm not making a polemical point because, you know, uh, the whole concept of the Trinity also depends on this. Um, I would note that while Lewis certainly identified six or you, Lewis, you identified six or seven places in the New Testament where theos or hothios, term for God, uh, is used for Jesus, right? 
Uh, there yeah. is some debate over whether those really say that, but let's you know let's accept that they do. So we have six or seven places uh, where Jesus is called God or the God. Uh, but I would just point out that predominantly uh, the term Pothios, the God, in the New Testament is used for the Father. Uh, and, and when it is used for the Father, what we do find is we find a, a distinction between God, the Father, and Lord Jesus, or his servant Jesus, or his son Jesus. And the point I'm simply trying to make here is almost in a formulaic way, the New Testament formulas seem to sort of, they pair God and Jesus. I just, they are certainly associated, but the fact that they're associated also means, I think, uh, textually speaking, there is a distinction that endures uh, throughout the New Testament between God the Father and Lord Jesus, or God the Father and his servant Jesus, and so on. So that's just important to make. Now, of course, what will happen is this distinction, I think Trinitarians will say, absolutely, there has to be a distinction because the, the person of the Father is different from the person of the Son. So you could interpret this different ways, uh, but it's there. That's, that's my point. The other thing I want to note is just in case you don't believe my reading, because who, you know, who am I? Uh, we do have Karl Rahner in his book, uh, Theological uh, Investigations, where he has an essay on Theos in the New Testament. And even his conclusion is that ha Theos, again, he's speaking as a Trinitarian, but he says ha Theos signifies the first person of the Trinity. Uh, he, one thing he does say, which is worth thinking about, is uh, ha Theos in the New Testament does not ever mean God the Trinity, right? It, it most, almost always means God the Father. Uh, and of course, he does mention those six places, six texts where Hothios is used to speak of, this, of Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. But again, this is just important because just from a frequency perspective uh, and from a formula perspective, there seems to be, in my eyes, some sort of priority of God the Father over the Lord Jesus or over the Son Jesus. Now, I'm pointing this out for a reason, and it's not to, to refute anything. I will come back to this, uh, but I'm just sort of finding it, but I'll return to this. It will be important uh, in a few minutes. Now, I will uh, admit that from the research of Larry Hurtado, uh, we do have this, I think, a strong claim that Jesus is the object of cultic worship but still within a monotheistic context. And the formula, what I get out of Larry Hurtado's argument, and the, see, he has put it in some, he has put it this way too, is that the early Christians who are monotheists, they worshiped God the Father through Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know if, if Lewis, you'll agree with that or not. Um, this is what he says. So he refers to devotional practice, such as prayer being offered to God, uh, through or in the name of Jesus. Uh, and he says here, Jesus functions as God's principal agent, which is interesting. I, now, this is, I would agree that Jesus is not a mere mortal uh, if he's included in, in the worship of God. Uh, but I think there's a debate, there is some reflection on sort of what is the status of Jesus. Again, I'm flagging this not to refute anything, uh, I'm flagging it for comparative purposes that I'll come to later. But let's just keep this in mind. The idea, from a New Testament point of view, the idea that God is worshipped, God is related to in Jesus' name or through Jesus, almost like in the New Testament era, whenever these texts are written, you can't really, a Christian can't worship God like independent of Jesus. I think that's the message that I take away from it. And I think that's very, very important in the development of Christianity. So let's just bracket that off. I will back reference this stuff. That's why I showed it. And it's, again, it's not for the purpose of, of, of making a scoring a point or anything. I want to sort of shift to the Quran very quickly. And I'm not going to go through the whole Quranic view of Jesus, because I think people know this already. I'm more interested in, in situating uh, what's going on here. So, uh, one thing that Sidney Griffith writes, Sidney Griffith himself is not a Muslim, but he says that uh, the Quran is responding, it's engaging with oral reports 
about prior scripture. So there's all this sort of oral commentary on the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible that's going on. And the Quran is very, the Quran is very much responding to that. That's why the Quran simply doesn't, it, it doesn't really copy stories out of the, the book of Genesis or Exodus or whatever. Uh, but you will find, for example, the Quran is conversing with the Talmud the Quran is conversing with the infancy gospels. The Quran is conversing with the proto uh, evangelium of James. Uh, there is some evidence the Quran is conversing with the uh, Syriac hymns of Saint Ephraim, for example. Uh, so this is there. And what I, the, the first point I wanna make is that this should be expected because the Quran comes into being uh, in an age where Bible commentary such as the Talmud and such as the, uh, the other literature, Bible commentary is what is being produced and circulated. Uh, it's almost like there's a new layer of discourse on top of the canonical Bible. So the Quran is part of that milieu and you would expect the Quran to be in conversation with this post-biblical literature. So the Quran, Literarily speaking, the Quran should not really be compared with the New Testament or the Old Testament because it doesn't belong to that age. Uh, literarily speaking, the Quran, the Quran's counterparts are really the Talmud, the Book of Jubilees, and some of these other post-biblical texts. And the Quran itself should be seen as a post-biblical text. So that's one thing to point out about the context. Now, to get more specific, some people, uh, maybe in the chat, and I've seen this in polemical points, some people will say, well, how can a divinely revealed or divinely inspired discourse like the Quran, why, why would the Quran be responding to and engaging uh, the beliefs and the myths of, of its contemporary audience? Uh, and to that, I would say that this is simply, that's not a new thing, right? Uh, many of you will, will accept that the book of Genesis was uh, responding to certain Babylonian or Mesopotamian creation myths with, with its own creation myth that somewhat mirrored those and modified it, right? Uh, we know reading the New Testament that New Testament authors are quoting the gospels, uh, sorry, they're quoting the Hebrew Bible, they're quoting the prophets. Uh, they're also engaging with, you know, second temple Jewish ideas. Uh, so we have to see, sort of put the Quran in the same place. And as to the theological argument behind this, one thing, if we read the Quran very carefully, the Quran does not claim to be a carbon copy of God's heavenly book or God's heavenly revelation. The Quran never, it does not claim to be a carbon copy of that. Uh, what the Quran claims to be is an adaptation or a discourse that is tailored for its Arabic audience that comes from God's heavenly writing, but it's not identical to it. And so there's several references to this. Uh, and I've quoted some verses here for you, but you can see here the wording here. The, the Quran claims to be signs from God's heavenly writing that have been adapted, i.e. tailored for its people. That's why the Quran is in Arabic. So in the Quranic worldview, God's heavenly writing is not an Arabic text. It's something far more abstract. And what happens is the concept of revelation within the Quran is the idea that God's heavenly writing, God's revelatory decrees through a process of revelation have been transformed so as to be tailored into something that is in Arabic so the audience around Muhammad can understand it. And that's precisely why these tailored Quranic revelations will be responding to the Jewish, Christian, and pagan milieu uh, that the Quran was revealed in. So that's, that's the context. Uh, so now if we uh, sort of, uh, one last point on this is Holger Zelenton, who's an academic, he's not a Muslim himself, but he points this out. He says that the Quran is engaged in a well-informed trialogue with both Christians and Jews. So my message on the context is that although many of the Christian audience here, you might see, you know, the Quran as this like, uh, you know, uh, heretical text, uh, you, should, you could also see the Quran as part of this broader conversation that is involving Jews and Christians in, in the seventh century and the centuries prior. Now, uh, the Quran says Jesus is a prophet. 
prophets in the Quran have a higher status than prophets in the Bible, right? Uh, in the Quran, uh, the prophets are representatives of God. Uh, they're protected from committing sins. They are intercessors between God and humankind. So the Quranic idea of a prophet in some ways is much higher. It's much more elevated than the biblical idea of a prophet. The Quranic prophet, whoever they are, are, are they're much more than a delivery service for something. They themselves are moral and spiritual uh, exemplars. So uh, we hear in many Quranic verses that the prophets have been chosen by God. They've been cleansed by God. There are many prophets. And Jesus is part of the highest grade of Quranic prophet. In the last verse here, there are five prophets mentioned in the Quran called the possessors of resolution. Uh, that's Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. So Jesus is part of the highest category of Quranic prophets. So he's not a minor figure. Now, another thing to note about Jesus' status in the Quran is that uh, the virgin birth is affirmed, as people know. Uh, his mission to the Israelites is affirmed. Some of the idea of him coming to confirm the Torah, the law, and the prophets, that is affirmed as well. But I, I want to point out that the idea of the messenger of God in the Quran is a very high status. So not just anyone can be a messenger of God. If you read what the Quran says about the role of Prophet Muhammad, who is the last messenger of God, you would also get insight into the role of Jesus as well. Because if Muhammad is a messenger of God, and this diagram here, I don't know if people can read it that well, but this diagram that you see here in the circle, this is a summary of some of Muhammad's roles, right? Now, Muhammad is a messenger of God. If the Quran says Jesus is a messenger of God, then it follows that Jesus, in his lifetime, would have played the same roles, spiritual roles, as Muhammad. So that's very important to know. So I know some Christians feel that Muslims demean Jesus or the Quran is like lowering Jesus than what he really is. But within the tradition uh, of the Quran, Jesus has a very high status. And we can even expand on that. And now I'm going to tie back to what, what I, I noted from the New Testament, right? So, so far I've talked about the prophet, the prophet rank of Jesus in the Quran, which does tie back to the New Testament. There is continuity between the New Testament discourse of Jesus as a prophet and the Quranic discourse of Jesus as a prophet. So that's one continuity. That's what I'm trying to show you guys. Here's another set of continuity. So, Lewis, you mentioned this. You mentioned in your talk that there are certain deeds or acts of God that Jesus performs in the New Testament. Uh, and other scholars have also noted this too. So the first thing I want to point out is that in these verses here, these are verses about Prophet Muhammad, but they would apply to every messenger of God, including Jesus. In these verses, a particular action that's done toward Muhammad, done toward the messenger, is then ascribed to God. So the first verse those who give their allegiance to you, they have given it to God. So Muhammad, people give their allegiance to Muhammad, but it is said they did it to God. The, right after, in the same verse, it says when, when someone comes and places their hand in front of Muhammad and Muhammad accepts their allegiance with his hand, the Quran says the hand of God is above their hands. So that's very interesting because we're not talking about a mere messenger. Uh, the second line of verses, he who obeys the messenger obeys God. Another one, talking about Muhammad, you did not throw when you threw, but it is God who threw. So this is basically saying that even Muhammad's action, Muhammad as a messenger, some of his actions are ascribed to God. It is, theologically speaking, God did that act. Uh, the last one here, Muhammad is told, this is actually the Quranic atonement uh, practice. I know this has come up in perhaps other videos. The Quranic, the Quran does have an atonement procedure. And in that procedure, Muhammad plays what looks to be a, a priestly role, like a Levite. And Muhammad is to, is to accept an offering from the people who want to be forgiven by God. And Muhammad takes that, and then Muhammad cleanses them. That's what the verse says. But the, the verse right after says, 
do they not know that it is God who accepts repentance and receives the offering? So physically, Muhammad received the offerings from his community for their forgiveness of their sins. And Muhammad cleansed them. But the verse is saying that actually it is God who accepted that repentance. And it is God who, who received their offerings. So this is telling us that Muhammad, the messenger of God in his own lifetime, functioned as a stand-in of God. He functioned as the substitute of God, the viceroy of God. Uh, and then there's a whole other examples of verses, and I won't read them all, but they, there are several verses that almost present the pair, God and his messenger, as a single agent. And here are some of them. Uh, numerous verses say, obey God and his messenger. It, it's repeated like a formula in the Quran. But practically speaking, when you were, if you were alive at that time, obey God and his messenger practically meant obey Muhammad. So there's one act of obedience here, but it's to God and his messenger as a totality. Uh, so that's one set. Uh, you have respond to God and his messenger when he summons you to what gives you life. And there's an ambiguity here because this verbal phrase, when he summons you, who's, who's the agent? Is it God? Is it the messenger? Is it both of them together? So the Quran is ambiguous. And, and there's this suggestion that although ontologically God and Muhammad are, are different, functionally, they are one functionally speaking. So this is, again, what I call conjoined agency between God and the messenger in the Quran. And if this is true about Muhammad in the Quran, it would also be true about Jesus in the Quran. Uh, there are more examples talking about when a matter has been decided by God and his messenger. So who's deciding? Is God deciding? Is Muhammad deciding? They're deciding as a unit, but it's a singular verbal conjugation. Do not be for this is talking about this this fourth one here. Do not be forward in the presence of God and his messenger. Again, so it's talking about you're going to see Muhammad in person, but it's saying you're in the presence of God and his messenger. So how does that work? Again, it's like they may be two parties, but they act as one agent. Uh, there's more examples of this, which I won't go through, but this suffices to make a point. Now, look at the formula here. Right. What's happening at some level is that God is an agent indirectly through Muhammad. And this reminds me of many of the New Testament formulas that I cited earlier, where this notion of God, the Father and Lord Jesus, and it, there, it's almost formulaic. So in the letters of Paul and other letters, for example, it's always like we seek we give thanks to God and the Lord Jesus, right? God the Father and Jesus Christ. So I, I'm saying that there is a Quranic parallel to that New Testament formula. That, that's my point that I'm trying to make here. So, so this is important, uh, actually, because it changes the way when, when the Quran says Jesus is a messenger of God, but if this is what the messenger is, if the messenger has conjoined agency with God, then that tells us something about Jesus. Uh, what I would also show is, and this parallels another thing you said, Lewis. Lewis, you said that there are certain names and acts of God in the Gospels that Jesus performs. We do find something similar in the Quran, where there are certain divine names in the Quran which have a definite article. And sometimes the divine names in the Quran don't have a definite article, mind you. Right? It could be, you know, it could have the al, it may not. Um, but God is named with many names. And there are many cases where Muhammad is named with the same name. Or Muhammad performs an act that implies that he has the agency of that divine name. Uh, and I've given you examples here. And I've written a whole, uh, I've written a peer-reviewed article where I've also sort of expanded on this. Uh, but I'm trying to make the point here that in the Quran, God's messenger, whether that is Muhammad or whether that is Jesus, God's messenger embodies God's names. And I'm doing this for a reason. I'm, I'm actually trying to stress that although Muslims generally, or the Quran generally will say Jesus is not God, he's a messenger of God, and Christians will say Jesus is God, 
I think that that division in some context has been overstated and that if we read these texts intertextually and closely, some of that theological divide could be bridged if we could start reading our text more closely like this. The final example that I will mention, now we're sort of leaving the Quran, we're going forward two, three centuries, four centuries in Islamic thought. We have this idea of the light of Muhammad. The light of Muhammad is, is a very old idea. Uh, it's based on a hadith, which is not in the Sunni legal collections, but it's a frequently cited hadith where the prophet says, Muhammad says, the first thing that God created was my life. And many Muslim mystics and philosophers uh, would expand on that hadith. So here you have Sahala Tustari, who, you know, he, he's living in the ninth century, which is still relatively early. And he has a whole discourse about the light of Muhammad, how God creates the light of Muhammad uh, as a light from his own light. So the light of Muhammad, so not, it's not talking about the body of Muhammad, the light of Muhammad, the spiritual essence of Muhammad has manifested. That's what the word is, say, Azhara. So God caused the light of Muhammad to Azhara to manifest from his own light. That sounds familiar, doesn't it, Lewis? It sounds a little bit Nicene, right? This idea of from the same substance, right? Light from light. So you have that already in the 800s with different Muslim mystical thinkers, Shia and, and Sufi. Uh, and we are told uh, by these thinkers, Tustari is one of them, but uh, we are told that the light of Muhammad is the equivalent theologically to God's word, be God's creative word, right? So later thinkers... Uh, Muslim thinkers, Sufis, Ismailis, uh, Twelve or Shi'is, they'll say that the light of Muhammad is God's word. It's God's logos. And here you have a clear parallel between the logos of the Gospel of John and what, what I'm presenting here, which is a Muslim logos theology centered around Muhammad. And then this idea, the light of Muhammad, it really reaches a culmination with the Sufi mystic Ibn Arabi, uh, where he talks about how sort of the light of Muhammad manifests from God's essence, and that's how God becomes known. So without the light of Muhammad, nothing would exist. Uh, nothing would be created. And from a cosmic perspective, it looks like this. You have God, who's said to be absolutely transcendent, reminds you of, you know, no man has seen God or the Father at any time except through the Son. And then the first manifestation is the light of Muhammad. And Muslim mystical thinkers, uh, again, uh, Ismaili, Sufi, Twelve or Shia, they will all say that the names of God, the 99 names, for example, they properly belong to the light of Muhammad because God in his essence is beyond names. And then the creation of the spiritual world and the physical world comes out of the light of Muhammad. So this is very important because I've noticed that well, every dialogue that I've seen, and, and I, I surely haven't seen all of them, but every Christian Muslim dialogue that I see, it makes no reference to this concept. And if you think about it, this idea of the light of Muhammad as this sort of pre-eternal origination or manifestation of God that m m many Muslims believe in. I won't say all Muslims believe in it because Muslims are quite diverse, but a, a good, a fair, a plurality of Muslims over history believe in this idea in some form. This would be the closest Islamic analog to Christian logos theology of the eternal son of God, right? So that's why I'm pointing this out. And then of course the question is, well, what about Jesus as a person and Muhammad as a person? So what we end up with, is um, this idea that the Mohammedan light, the light of Muhammad would be the highest eternal reflection of God's essence, which is totally simple. Uh, so you have that. And then what happens is, again, this is my claim that you have an analogy. I believe, I'm not saying they're identical concepts. I would never say that, but I believe we have an analogy between the son of God, eternally begotten before the ages, light from light, true God from true God, that that corresponds to in Islamic thought, the light of Muhammad, which is originated from God's essence as God's self manifestation. And some refer to the light of Muhammad as God's breath. So this is very important. But then if you go forward, 
Um, the whole creation has come from the light of Muhammad. Again, this rings the bell to the Gospel of John, right? Uh, without the Logos, uh, nothing made would have been made, right? Everything was made through him. So that, that matches. Uh, and then what we have in, in a Muslim context is for those Muslims who believe in this idea, and again, it's a sizable number uh, through the ages who believe in this, including many today, the historical Muhammad, so the, the individual person of Muhammad is understood to be a reflective mirror of the light of Muhammad. And what that means is that the historical Muhammad, the person of Muhammad in this view is the manifestation of God's names on earth in human form. And Jesus also, because all the thinkers who believe in this idea, they would say that Jesus, when he was here, Jesus was the mirror of the light of Muhammad. So Jesus reflects God's attributes on earth within this particular theology, right? So that's what you have. And this is, I'm not saying that this is identical. This is not a trinity, and it's certainly not incarnational, uh, but it is something much closer than the usual Jesus, just a prophet and a human, like let's go home now type discourse that we hear. So Reza Shah Kazemi, and I'll end with this, he's one of the few scholars who've picked, who's picked up on this. I really think there's only a handful. Uh, he's picked up on it. I picked up on it. Uh, Ali Atai of uh, Zaytuna in his dissertation, he's picked up on this too. Um, so those of us who picked up on this, for us, uh, there's basically a parallel, there's a correspondence. Um, within an esoteric Muslim point of view, what a Muslim could see Jesus and Prophet Muhammad as human manifestations uh, of the Logos. Uh, and one could easily read the New Testament. One could look at everything that Lewis has presented uh, from a Muslim perspective and easily uh, interpret it in light of this sort of mystical Islamic uh, cosmology that I've noted here. So that's sort of the message that I want to leave on this, that we don't, we have, of course, these are different beliefs, but I really, I really think that the theological divide uh, between Christian and Muslim views of Jesus in some ways has been overstated only because this uh, Shi'i, Ismaili, Sufi view of the light of Muhammad uh, and its manifestation through human mirrors, that this has simply been ignored. So I think if we start taking this seriously, uh, Muslims and Christians may have a better opening uh, in which to understand uh, one another. So uh, I apologize for going longer than you, Lewis, but uh, thank you uh, for letting me share this. Good. Now, we have a little bit of time, not a whole lot, but just a little bit of time to maybe go over the crucifixion. So if you want to do that, uh, briefly, Lewis, and then Dr. Andani, sure. you can do that, and then we'll uh, get into some Q&A, if that's okay with y'all. Up to y'all. All right, sure. So I'm going to do a presentation now on the cross of Christ. So um, this is part two of the uh, presentation for me. So the incarnation, which I mentioned at the very beginning, is important because that marks the beginning of Jesus' salvific work. But uh, as every Christian knows, the story that begins in the major um, ultimately uh, leads towards the cross. The reason why Jesus was born uh, on this earth was that so he can make um, atonement for our sins. And this is an idea that is... Um, fleshed out progressively as scripture is revealed. Um, I'm reminded of a quote from Pope Emeritus Benedict the 16th in one of his works, um, Jesus of Nazareth, part two. He says this, and I quote, the idea of vicarious atonement pervades the entire history of religions. In many different ways, people have tried to deflect the threat of disaster from the king, from the people, from their own lives by transferring it to a substitute evil must be atoned for, and in this way justice must be restored. The punishment, the unavoidable misfortune, is offloaded onto others in an effort to liberate oneself." Unquote. So according to um, Ratzinger, the idea of the necessity of atonement is something that actually um, is part of the human psyche, and it finds expression in the major religions of the world whenever they perform acts of sacrifice. And we see this, of course, in the uh, Bible. 
Um, even from the very first book of the Bible in Genesis, we already have um, sacrifices being made early on, you know, Cain and Abel uh, giving their respective sacrifices. The idea of like a um, cult of sacrifice um, develops further on when we get to the time of Moses. If you read through the Pentateuch, um, and we did do a presentation on Leviticus uh, earlier this month where I talked about this in more detail, you have what is called the Yom Kippur um, sacrifice, which is part of the series of sacrifices that God um, created for the people of Israel, but this is the most important of their sacrifices because this is where uh, the priest makes sacrifices for the people. So in Leviticus 16, verse 34, it says this, And this shall be an everlasting statute for you, that atonement may be made for the people of Israel once in the year because of all their sins. And then in Leviticus 17, 11, it says this, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you upon the altar to make atonement for your sins. For it is the blood that makes atonement by reason of the life. So the idea of what... Sorry, Lewis. I... Lewis, did you want to screen share? Oh, sorry. That? Did, did these um, did it, was this screen share not working? I I think you may have oh. to Ch try it this. one more time. I'm sorry because I think that I need to uh, press a button here. I apologize. That's on me. Okay. Okay. So I'm okay. So here we yeah, go. Yeah, you have to like send a request and then I accept it. Um, oh, sorry. If yeah. you sent it, I apologize. I didn't see it. Yeah, actually, I forgot to press the button. Here we go. Okay. Um, no, Here we go. that slide. Um, da, 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 da. So here's the Ratzinger quote again. You only missed a couple of slides. So um, and that's from part two of his Jesus of Nazareth series of books. And then here are the two quotes that I gave from the book of Leviticus. Now, the to continue on, the... Levitical sacrificial system was never meant to be permanent. Um, from a Christian perspective, the idea was always that these sacrifices pointed forward to something that is greater than itself. And this is hinted at even within the Old Testament itself. Um, the best example of that is in Isaiah chapter 53, where you have the suffering servant song. And um, I won't quote the whole thing, but here's uh, an excerpt from it in verses uh, 4 to 6. Um, one of the fun facts about this passage is that it is one of the most cited bits of the Old Testament in the New. Uh, several books of the New Testament quote this specific passage and apply to the life of Christ. So there is a strong tradition um, in Christianity of taking these passages and seeing them as uh, prophecies of the uh, redemptive suffering of the Messiah. And even in rabbinic Judaism, you have the occasional glimpses of that um, insight in the Talmud and in the Targums, uh, where they refer to the Messiah as the one who suffers in this passage. But of course, Judaism uh, has rejected that idea. So it's never really fully developed in their writings. Now we get to the New Testament and we have Jesus um, saying multiple times that he is to die for the sins of mankind. And he says this even before uh, the actual crucifixion itself. So multiple times he drops hints of what he's about to do. In Mark chapter 10, verse 45, he says, for the Son of Man also came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In John chapter 10, verses 17 to 18, he says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. So Jesus here is saying that uh, he can only die because he... Uh, chooses to lay down his life and that he does it in obedience to the father's mission for him and after his death the um, you know his um, crucifixion becomes the main centerpiece of the apostles preaching and we see this for example in the writings of Saint Paul who um, 
reflects upon the work of Christ and what it means for those who believe in him. Uh, one of the key passages, for example, is in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15, where he says this, And you who are dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, having canceled the bond which stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in him. So St. Paul gives us his theory of theory of atonement, as it were, and we'll talk a little bit more about theories of atonement later on. But um, you see here the beginnings of a reflection of what exactly does it mean to say that Jesus died for us. And here he states that his Jesus' death was a means by which he disarms the principalities and powers of this world. And it's also a means by which he cancels the legal demands that have been placed upon us due to sin. And these are things that are all going to factor into later Christian thinking about what exactly the cross does for us. And again, to quote Ratzinger, quote, the belief that all sacrifices are fulfilled in the cross of Jesus Christ, that in him the underlying intention of all sacrifices accomplished, namely expiation, that Jesus is in this way has taken the place of the temple, that he himself is the new temple. All this lies at the very heart of Paul's teaching. So you see all of those examples of sacrifice in the Old Testament. And here, when we fast forward to the New Testament, specifically Paul's epistles, um, he you, he takes all of this as the fulfillment of the, that old sacrificial system. Now, what exactly does the cross of Christ do for us? That's one of those things that uh, Christians have explained in different ways throughout history. And in general, you will find that six major theories of atonement have developed to explain uh um, the work of Christ. Now, there are a bunch of minor theories besides this, but the most important theories to make note of are the, the six. So one of the earliest theories that develops is something called the ransom theory. This is the idea that Christ's sacrifice was in some way uh, making payment to Satan, and Satan was the one who holds humanity captive for their sin. So this finds expression in some patristic writings, but it's not universal among the church fathers mind you and it dies out as time goes on because as the christian uh theologians and church fathers reflect on the cross they tend to find this to be an inadequate uh way of explaining what jesus christ did another similarly ancient view is the idea of christus victor so Christ's sacrifice is a triumphal conquering of the powers of sin and death. We see this in the passage that I quoted from St. Paul about uh, disarming the principalities and powers. And many of the key works on the death of Christ, such as that of St. Athanasius, uh, tends towards this view. And it is the predominant way in which the Eastern Orthodox Church, for example, has understood the death of Christ. Now, before I go on, I should point out that a lot of these theories, they're not mutually exclusive. So a person could easily hold to more than one theory or maybe even all of them. And the uh, traditions which I placed in parentheses will tend to emphasize one theory or another, but that's not to say that um, they hold to that view exclusively. So um, I say that Eastern Orthodox primarily hold to Christus Victor, but there's nothing preventing someone from a Catholic or a Protestant tradition from believing this theory as well. And in fact, that is the majority view for much of the first um, half of Christian history. In the second half, you have the beginnings of more uh, legally oriented theories of atonement. And one of the major ones is what is known as the satisfaction theory, which was developed by St. Anselm in his book, Cur Deus Homo. And in Cur Deus Homo, uh, St. Anselm is uh, answering the questions of a hypothetical uh, questioner about why is it necessary to believe that God became man and what exactly does that do for us? So he 
goes on to explain the cross and St. Anselm uh, speaks about sin as something which violates God's honor. And because God's honor is uh, violated, satisfaction must be made. But because uh, of God's infinite honor, an infinite satisfaction needs to be made. And the only one who can make such a, satis such a satisfaction is God himself, which is why God in the person of Jesus Christ had to be the one to make that um, uh, satisfaction. And this theory is important because the next couple of theories are in some ways um, elaborations of the satisfaction theory. So they take the basic framework which St. Anselm developed and um, expand on it further. So when you get to the Protestant Reformation, uh, two other theories uh, develop. One uh, which is held more by Calvinist and Reformed Protestants, another which is held more by Wesleyan or Armenian Protestants. So in the Reformed tradition, the death of Christ is mostly seen in terms of penal substitution. So penal substitution is the idea that Christ's sacrifice isn't just of making satisfaction, but it's actually taking on the punishment that is due to humanity for their sins. So you'll often hear uh, preachers uh, in evangelical churches talk about um, the wrath of God coming upon Jesus at the cross. So that is a distinctly reformed way of explaining how um, Jesus dies for our sins. Contrast with that, you have the idea of the governmental theory of atonement, which was developed by the uh, Dutch Arminian theologian Hugo Grotius. And Grotius' idea was a little bit different from penal substitution. He found that idea objectionable and wanted to explain the atonement in a different way. So according to Grotius, um, God is to be thought of as like a governor who is desirous to forgive us, but is also bound to maintain uh, order and justice. So what Jesus' death does is... Um, it balances out the order and justice that has been um, wronged by our sin, and it enables God uh, to uh, forgive us while still remaining just. So there is this idea here that God is, in a sense, um, abiding by a higher standard of justice. And then finally, uh, you have one of what is called the more subjective theory of atonement. So Peter Abelard, who was a medieval theologian, came up with something called the moral influence theory. So according to Peter Abelard, um, Christ's sacrifice is primarily to be thought of subjectively. So like rather than thinking in terms of um, Christ's sacrifice actually changing uh, something about us, it move or changing our legal state, it actually moves the conscience of the person towards God. Now, I think Peter Abelard may have also held to a more legally oriented uh, view of atonement, but moral influence was something that he added on top of that. And this theory was not very popular for most of um, earlier history, but in the past couple centuries, with the rise of liberal Protestantism, it has made a comeback with many um, of the liberal Protestant theologians in the 19th and early 20th centuries thinking of the death of Christ in terms of moral influence. So these are all of the different ways that the death of Christ has been explained in a nutshell. And uh, while it's good to think about the relative merits and demerits of them, it's worth noting that they are, at the end of the day, all just theories. And I want to quote in this regard something that C.S. Lewis said in Mere Christianity. So he says that these different theories of atonement are you know, just different ways of understanding the event, and they should not be uh, conflated with the event itself. So part of his quote says this, We are told that Christ was killed for us, that his death was wa has washed out our sins, and that by dying he disabled death itself. That is the formula. That is Christianity. That is what has to be believed. Any theories we build up as to how Christ's death did this are, in my view, quite secondary. Mere plans or diagrams to be left alone if they do not help us, and even if they do help us, are not to be confused with the thing itself. The important thing to remember is that Jesus did indeed die on the cross, and that is 
the event that makes Christianity what it is and is the thing that all Christians will affirm. I want to end with a quote by St. Athanasius on the death of Christ. Um, like, if you want an explanation of why uh, Jesus was born, died, rose again as he did, um, St. Athanasius composed what is considered one of the greatest Christian classics on that work, and it's almost universally um, accepted by Christians. So you know, um, it should be agreeable regardless of what tradition one comes from. So he says this in one section, quote, after demonstrations of his divinity from his works, he now offered the sacrifice on behalf of all, delivering his own temple to death in the stead of all, in order to make all not liable to and free from the ancient transgression, and to show himself superior to death, displaying his own body as incorruptible, the first fruits of the universal resurrection." Unquote. And with that, I conclude my presentation. All right, Dr. Andani, uh, your understanding of the crucifixion? I'm not able to hear you. Are, are you on mute by any chance? Yeah, I'm just, uh, thank you, uh, Lewis. Um, I'm just going to bring my thing up. Give me one second here. All right, and I'm just gonna do my screen share. Okay, so uh, this is gonna be much shorter than than my last little bit. Uh, so I'm simply going to talk about uh, what does the Quran actually say about Jesus' death and crucifixion, and I'm going to uh, argue that. The Quran taken in itself and read within a 7th century context, the Quran does not deny the fact of Jesus' death and crucifixion. That is what I'm going to show. Uh, however, later, you know, post-Quranic understandings, post-Quranic interpretations of the Quran uh, that are that became the majority of Sunni and 12 or Shia interpretation, those interpretations do deny the death of Jesus. But the Quran itself, taken in its own context, does not actually deny the death and crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, so let me sort of demonstrate that. Uh, and this is a topic that continues to be debated. If you just go on Twitter, you'll find like entire Twitter thread debates about this. All right, so let's begin with what we tend to hear, okay? So I will admit that if you read the Quran in a certain way, the Quran appears to deny that Jesus was crucified. And as a result of this apparent denial, uh, combined with later material, uh, many Muslims deny that Jesus died at all. Uh, so the verse, of course, that the hot the hotspot verse is is this right? These few verses. Uh, as for their saying, and this is this verse is often just sort of interpreted atomistically, is interpreted by itself, uh, you know. So it says, as for their saying, we killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, messenger of God, yet they did not kill him, neither crucified him. It was only made to appear so to them. Those who are at variance, i.e. those who differ, concerning him surely are in doubt regarding him. They have no knowledge of him except the following of surmise, and they killed him not of a certainty. No, indeed, God raised him up to himself. So if you just read this, the only thing you read from the Quran is this, you may say, okay, the Quran says Jesus wasn't crucified. Uh, I admit that. Uh, what what a lot of uh, Muslim Quran interpreters would do is they would read this in isolation, right? And then what they would do is they would uh, look to material outside the Quran. And, and, and the most popular sort of set of materials is called uh, the substitution legend, 
which is found in a genre of Quranic interpretation called tafsir. And I can just show you a very, very quick example of that. So here on the screen is a, uh, a book by Todd Lawson called The Crucifixion in the Quran. And you can see here that uh, this idea of uh, Jesus being not being killed at all uh, comes from you know, 8th century. So about 100 years after Muhammad, we get these materials, okay? So this statement here, this it claims to come from Muhammad's cousin, Ibn Abbas. So it's not even claimed to be from the Prophet Muhammad himself. But um, they say that Prophet Muhammad's cousin interpreted the verse, and he basically said, and here's the key thing here, uh, that the likeness of Jesus was cast upon Natianus. Okay, so someone else was crucified instead of Jesus, and he was made to look like Jesus. So this is how, uh, frankly, many Muslims over the centuries, they came to interpret the Quranic verses I showed you, but they're relying on what everybody will admit is material outside the Quran. For this interpretation because the quran itself if you go to the actual wording right the quran itself does not say someone else was put on the cross as a substitute it, that's not what the arabic says the arabic only says it was made to appear to them and the question that one would ask is the Quran here has this pronoun them that's recurring throughout this verse. Who is the who is they? Because this group, they, them, they claimed, they said, we killed the Messiah, the son of Mary. And then the Quran says they did not kill him. So who is they? And to really understand what this verse means, we have to sort of just go back a few verses before okay so this is chapter 4 154 to 158 let's just backtrack a few verses so now here we are so that now we're actually at 154 158 this here is 157 so now we're just looking at the we're looking at, at the quran in context which is what anybody should read anything in context so now we hear that the quran is talking about a group referred to as them it's accusing this group of transgressing the sabbath it's accusing them of breaking their oath. It's accusing them of disbelieving in, in God's signs. It's accusing them of killing the prophets. It's accusing them of unbelief. It's accusing this group, a group of people, of slandering Mary, the mother of Jesus. And then it moves on to talk about this group of people. And who are they? Um, this is actually certain Jewish enemies of Jesus, right? That's what this verse is. So it's talking about them. Uh, it's giving you a laundry list of sins committed by certain Jewish enemies of Jesus. It says you did this and you did this and you did this. And then it says at the end of that laundry list for their saying that we killed the Messiah, son of Mary. And, and many translators rightfully say for their boast. So this group apparently slandered Mary and then they boasted that they killed Jesus, right? So the Quran is rebutting the claim of certain uh, unrighteous Israelites, actually, to have slandered Mary and killed Jesus, killed and crucified him. So the Quran, on the face of it, is not actually denying that Jesus was crucified. It's denying that Jesus' enemies, the disbelievers, killed jesus so this group of people who did not believe in jesus were boasting they were taking credit for killing him because you know if you the, the, the it's a polemical claim that oh we killed this person how could he be the messiah now as further proof of the reading that i'm offering you um there are two verses in the quran where it says god caused jesus to die so here you have another verse of the quran surah 3 verse 55 God says to Jesus, Jesus, I will cause you to die and will raise you to me. Notice the common theme here. This verse, the crucifixion verse, says that Jesus' enemies did not kill Jesus, but rather God raised Jesus to himself. And in this verse of the Quran, it says God causes Jesus to die and then raises him to himself. So the Quranic message 
is not that Jesus did not die. That is not what the Quran is saying. If you just read the Quran, you know, holistically, what the Quran is saying is that the enemies of Jesus who boasted that they killed him, they cannot take credit for Jesus' death. Rather, ultimately, it is God who is responsible for the death of Jesus, that God is really in control of events, especially the death of Jesus. Uh, and even though Jesus died, the Quran is saying that Jesus went to God. So Jesus, this is very similar to the, the New Testament language of Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. The Quran is saying God raised Jesus to himself. Now, I would also say that the verb here to cause to die that I've transliterated, that verb appears 23 times in the Quran, and it always means God causing someone to die by taking the soul from the body. That's how this verb, uh, tawafa, is used in the Quran. It means God taking a soul at the time of death. So that's what the Quran is saying. And tw two verses say God is the one who took Jesus uh, by causing his death. Now, I would also propose that the Quran, whatever the Quran has said here, that it is God who is in control. God is responsible for the death of Jesus. I will say that this matches... Uh, closely with what we find in the New Testament, particularly the book of Acts. So this is a quote from Acts chapter 2. This is St. Peter's speech before the Israelites. And St. Peter said, he introduces them, he says, introduces Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you. And then this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. So let's just pause it there. Jesus was handed over to his enemies among the Is Israelites by God's plan and knowledge. That is That matches the Quran where God says to Jesus, I will cause you to die. And although Jesus' enemies physically may be the ones involved who, you know, who killed him, as Peter says, it is ultimately God who is responsible for that, that, that this was a divinely ordained event. Right, and then Peter says, "God raised Jesus to life, and exalted He is exalted to the right hand of God." And the Quran says, "God will raise Jesus to Himself." Right, two times over here. So I think that actually the Quran is right on the mark when it comes to the crucifixion of Jesus. And this is when you read the Quran holistically by itself, and then you read the Quran intertextually with the New Testament. You find that there is a consistent message now another context that we have to read the quranic verses on the right side against is the talmud right so the quranic verses that i've explained they seem to be directed against claims made in the talmud that were written you know one just one or two centuries before the quran uh in the babylonian ta the babylonian talmud it is claimed uh, that Jesus was born due to adultery between Mary and a Roman soldier. So that's a slander against Mary. Mary is called a harlot in the Babylonian Talmud, right? So she's insulted. Uh, Peter Schaefer in his book talks about, he summarizes this whole account. So that's a, that's a, a slander against Mary. Uh, the Babylonian Talmud further claims that Jesus was put on trial by the rabbis for 40 days before Passover, he was found guilty of sorcery or apostasy. Then it says he was stoned to death. And then after being stoned, the Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud claims, Jesus was hanged, crucified on a tree on Passover. That's what the Talmud says. Now, this is not a historical account, and nobody thinks it's a historical account, but it is a polemical account, right? This account in the Talmud, is a, it's an anti-Christian polemic. So that's what it's doing there. But already there's something weird going on because there's two claims being made in the Talmud. The cl first claim is that the rabbis killed Jesus. And the second claim is that they crucified him. So keep that in mind. Uh, and Peter Schaefer, of course, agrees with, with this interpretation. Uh, Rick Oaks is another scholar who's really looked into this. So uh, the Quranic verses, let's look at them again, right? Uh, look at the order. So the, the first part of that passage says, referring to this group of unrighteous, you know, unbelievers, 
they're uttering against Mary a mighty slander. What does that refer to? It probably refers to the Talmud or this claim in the Talmud that Mary is a harlot. That's the slander. And then it goes on to say, they're saying, who is they? Again, it's talking about those particular rabbis who claim this in the Talmud. So they're saying we killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary. And then the Quran says they did not kill him, neither crucified him. So, you know, two claims. They didn't kill him, and also they did not crucify him. Goes back to the Talmud, because the Talmud is claiming that A, they killed him by stoning, and then B, it's claiming they crucified him on a tree. So what I'm saying again is these Quranic verses, if you read them holistically in the Quran within a 7th century context, they are responding to the Talmud. Uh, this this is not, of course, I didn't come up with this reading. There are a number of modern scholars uh, who have also made this argument. So the conclusion is that uh, according to the Quran, what is being denied is that Jesus was killed and crucified by his enemies. And what is being affirmed is that it is God who is ultimately responsible for the death of Jesus. So the death of Jesus on the cross from a Quranic point of view did happen, uh, but it was ordained by God. And Jesus' enemies, despite their physical role, uh, cannot really claim to take credit for that. And uh, the last thing I'll just share is that I'll share one more atonement theory, which uh, uh, Lewis didn't mention, but there's a, some at uh, an atonement theory that uh, James Dunn, for example, has proposed as, as an early atonement theory. Uh, so this atonement theory is not is not based on forgiven uh, on sin atonement, but uh, James Dunn talks about uh, atonement uh, as covenant sacrifice. So as you all know, um, Pat, uh, Jesus' death on the cross was interpreted widely by Christian thinkers as uh, you know based on Passover, right? But what happened on Passover? Uh, the lamb that slaughtered on Passover and the blood. Uh, that's shed on Passover in Jewish thought is not for sins. It's not for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, it is rather a sign of the covenant. It sort of seals the covenant between God uh, and, and Israel, biblical Israel. So what James Dunn said is, and I've quoted him here for those who are interested, but we can also see that uh, Jesus' death on the cross, the blood of Jesus shed on the cross, uh, it's not an offering for sins in this perspective, but it is a covenant renewal offering, very much like the the Passover lamb actually was uh, in in its original context. And what James Dunn says is that this explains why you know the early Jewish Christians, which we read in Acts, they'd still continue to attend the temple. They still were sort of involved in in making sacrifices at the temple. Uh, so that the temple sacrifices for those early Christians was still there. And yet uh, Jesus' death on the cross was still seen as, you know, very, very important. So we could also see that as a covenant sacrifice as opposed to a sin offering. Uh, so I'll pause there, but I hope uh, I hope that was helpful. And, and I look forward to sort of hearing uh, comments from Lewis and others, uh, not just on this, but on sort of everything uh, we've talked about today. All right, so I think the I think we're gonna be fielding questions pretty soon. But before we do that, I do want to throw in at least one question for myself, and it's primarily with regards to the part about the person of Christ uh, from Muslim perspective. So you wanted to highlight the continuity between how Christians view God, how Muslims view God. And you said something about how uh, the differences tend to be overblown. But for me, when I read the Quran, it seems that a lot of the polemics against how Christians view God um, go back all the way to the Quran itself. For example, in Surat al-Ma'idah, um, it's stated many times that Christians are disbelievers for saying this. In Ayah 72, it says, Lakad kafara ladina kalu inna lahu wa masih ibn Maryam. So, you know, in English, those who say God is Messiah, son of Mary, have uh, disbelieved. And Tarif Khalidi, uh, in his book, The Muslim Jesus, uh, makes an interesting comment about the um, 
Quranic uh, view of Jesus. He says, the Quranic Jesus is in fact an argument addressed to his more wayward followers intended to convince the sincere and find the unrepentant. As such, he has little in common with the Jesus of the Gospels. So I'm wondering if, in your view, this is the uh, this is a justifiable way of looking at the Quranic presentation of Jesus and whether you uh, agree with the idea that um, these passages in the Quran are polemics addressed against Christians. You might want to unmute. Uh, thanks for the question. So I, I think the Quran is being polemical against certain Christians, but we don't know which Christians it's even addressed to. Uh, it could be uh, that the Quran is addressing, for example, monophysite Christians in particular, uh, you know, because, you know, sort of they, they, those Christians are, are in the area. The, also, the phrasing that the Quran employs is interesting. It says, like, those who say that God is the Messiah, son of Mary. I don't know, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know Christians who actually phrase it that way. Like you, to say Jesus is God is a different claim. It's a different proposition than to say God is Jesus. And the statement that the Quran uh, refutes and polemicizes is the statement, God is Jesus, right? So it seems like what the Quran is refuting is something very, very specific. And a, a lot of this goes back to what interpretive lens are we going to read the Quran with? So to give you an example, um, a Trinitarian Christian and a rabbinical Jew can both read the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, but you will both read it with completely different interpretive lenses. Similarly, even among Muslims, uh, two different Muslims will read the same Quran with, with two different interpretive frameworks. So this, the, the verse that you've cited, that says, verily, uh, those, th uh, those who say uh, that Allah, God, is the, is the Messiah, Son of Mary, they have disbelieved, right? That, that's the verse you're referring to. So here's an esoteric reading of the verse that you find from Ibn Arabi, the Sufi master, and his interpreters. So they will say that, look, the word translated here as disbelieve, right, uh, kafara, that word literally means to conceal or to cover. And this term in the Quran, uh, Ibn Maryam, son of Mary, that specifically is talking about the created human dimension of Jesus. So what the Quran is saying is that some Christians, those who equate or identify God with the created human dimension of Jesus, which, which is called the son of Mary, they quote unquote uh, are guilty of kufr, but kufr in Arabic means to cover, to cover over, to conceal. So what Ibn Arabi and his interpreters say is that the problem with some Christians is not that they say Jesus is God because Ibn Arabi and, and for reasons I've already given, uh, you can make that claim from a mystical perspective. You could say Jesus is God because technically Jesus is the locus of manifestation of God. So in one respect, the statement Jesus is God from a Sufi perspective can hold. Uh, the problem that the Sufis like Ibn Arabi would hold is that to equate the human dimension of Jesus, what, what is called Son of Mary, to equate that with God is to conceal God, to cover God by a human form, almost like to restrict God to only one manifestation and confuse the, the principle and the manifestation itself. So that's how Ibn Arbi and the Sufis will read that verse. They'll say that this verse is about sort of uh, an error in in the mystical understanding of who Jesus was, but no, I don't think every Christian falls into that because you do have in Christianity there's a clear distinction between the human and the divine nature of Jesus that they don't get confused, and then there's a further distinction between the eternal Son and the Father, uh, and depending on what framework you use, uh, some of those understandings are quite compatible with the Sufi 
or Shiite mystical theology uh, that I shared. So Thomas Aquinas's view of the Trinity, uh, where the Son of God is the Word of God, is actually quite compatible with the concept of the light of Muhammad uh, that I earlier shared. So it will come down to sort of what is my interpretive lens by which I'm reading uh, the Quran or other scriptures. There is a question here that uh, I wanted to get to, if that's okay with y'all. We're almost out of time here, I, and we can do a part three if y'all would like, if you would like to pick up the discussion and uh, address more questions. But there was one that I wanted to grab here. Uh, Dr. Javad Hashmi asks, do you think there is a connection to the Quranic verse that says the martyrs are not dead but alive with God? And I'll let you both answer that. So, Lewis, uh, if you want to comment on it, and then Dr. Andani. You there, Lewis? Oh, sorry. Uh, I don't really have any comments on this verse in particular. I just want to let uh, Dr. Andani um explain how he thinks this connects with the crucifixion passage yeah uh basically um if you look at it within a quranic context then you that verse should be taken to into account and uh the ismaili muslims who have always affirmed the crucifixion they always said that jesus was crucified uh when they were challenged by other muslims oh but the quran says this the ismaili said well uh, Jesus was a martyr, and therefore, if you read the Quran holistically, uh, the Quran says that the martyrs are still alive. Jesus was killed in God's way, uh, and you can also interpret the whole the verse "They did not kill him" uh, to mean that he is he is alive in God's presence, and Jesus, in his spirit, could never be killed. Like no matter who wants to claim that they did it. Uh, let, let's get to this one too, Dr. Andani, with respect to the point you brought up about the crucifixion and the Talmud, what do you think of the objection that the Talmud wasn't codified until after the Quran? Um, I, I'm not really sure if that's true. Uh, the, from what I've read, the, the Talmud, uh, and I, I had a quote uh, on one of my earlier slides that, that the, uh, the, this Talmudic material was already there before, before the Quran. Uh, now, maybe the text was not fully stable. I, I'm not a Talmud expert, um, but uh, all the secondary literature on this topic that I've read uh, says that this particular, this material, the Talmudic material uh, was already there uh, at least a century before the Quran. And, and we know this also because there are other uh, Quranic uh, evocations of Talmudic uh, material in other stories. I was looking for one uh, for for you, Lewis. I'm not seeing one offhand. If you yeah. if you see one, let me know. Uh, I do see one. Um, so somebody, I think, uh, how do I say? Micah Grace had an interesting question. He asked, uh, if has he stated that the Quran doesn't deny the fact that Jesus did die, why do Muslims believe the opposite? Should this study prove the validity of the Bible? So, so it's a two part. Um, question that Micah asked. Um, so the vast majority of Muslims do believe that um, that Jesus was not crucified because there is a well entrenched tradition of interpreting the um, crucifixion uh, passage that way. Like uh, I know Dr. Andani mentioned Todd Lawson's book, The Crucifixion in the Quran, and Dr. Lawson states that it doesn't need to be read that way. But even Dr. Lawson, in his survey of the different um, interpretive traditions that sprung up um, early on, notes that almost all of them, uh, with the possible exception of um, uh, the um, Shi'i tradition, um, affirm some version of the substitution theory. So it pops up early on and it's very widespread. Uh, as to the question of whether it um, proves the validity of the Bible, well, I don't know that if that, that by itself would prove it. Um, what the least it would do is it would undermine a lot of the uh, popular polemics that um, a lot of Muslim apologists would use um, when they try to cover the topic, um, you could, you know, accuse them of not really um, 
giving just not giving enough justice to all the different facets of the uh, debate and different ways that the passage can be interpreted. But you know, I think uh, in order to say that the Bible is valid, there are a few extra steps that need to be taken before we can arrive at a conclusion like that. Last one here uh, for Dr. Andani, based on the of the presented views of Christ's divinity and the Muslim views. Uh, do Christians and Muslims adore the same God? I mean, this is a whole question in itself. Uh, I, I, I actually, I, I'm not a fan of the question, although I believe it should be talked about. Um, but I don't answer yes, and I don't answer no, uh, because it all depends on the intent of the question and and what the what the what the yardstick is for same God. So, I mean, one can argue. That if you say no, that they don't believe in the same God. But I would argue uh, if someone says that two different gods are being worshipped, I would argue that I think some Christians worship a different God than other Christians. Uh, and I said this on a prior show. So I think the Trinity of William Lane Craig and the Trinity of Thomas Aquinas are different gods if by, by a certain standard. Uh, I also think that the God of, um, you know, Hanbali, uh, theology is a, it, it, is it conceptually it's a diff that's a different god than than the god of Ismaili theology or Sufi theology because frankly Christians themselves have different concepts of God that are that conflict with each other and then Muslims among themselves have different concepts of God but if we're going to say that okay uh, amidst all the diversity Muslims worship the same God as one another and Christians worship the same God as one another then I think we should we should admit that uh, Christians and Muslims do worship the same God especially because Christians say that they worship the same God as Jews and Jews I mean going from Maimonides and others Jews will say that the Muslims worship the same God as them so it really depends on like what what is our standard for like the same God? If it's the same concept of God, uh, then frankly, one could argue every person worships a different God. Uh, but if it's a much broader standard, then I think the answer uh, is yes, that Muslims and Christians do worship the same God. Uh, but again, what's the deeper intent? Because sometimes this rhetoric of it's not the same God uh, is often used uh, to make a number of straw man arguments, right? Such as, oh, and it, the Muslim God is not all loving and the Christian God is. Again, it depends which Muslim God are we talking about, right? The Sufis would say that God is love itself. God is Rahma. Rahma means loving compassion. Other Muslims might say, no, God is not all loving. It depends which school you follow. Uh, so I'm opposed to the weaponization of the question. Uh, sometimes the phrase, uh, that we don't worship the same God is used as a cultural attack on Muslims living in Western nations to alienate Muslims from wider societies. The idea that, oh, we, you know, this is a Judeo Christian society and Muslims don't belong here. I'm completely against that rhetoric, right? Uh, even the, the whole idea of Judeo Christian is a 20th century invention uh, of American culture, as everybody should know. So I, I really think it depends. Uh, if we want to get into the nitty gritty details, I'm happy to entertain that uh, many groups worship different gods. And in some cases, the God of Catholics, the, the, the concept of God subscribed to by most Catholics, will find similarity to, you know, Ismaili Shia and Sufi concepts of God, but it won't have similarity to the more legalistic concepts of God in Islam. So it very much depends. Yeah. So can I, I just want to say a few things about this question coming from, from the Catholic perspective. So there's no, um, you know, there's no secret that, you know, if you read the documents of the Second Vatican Council, particularly Lumen Gentium and Nostra Aetate, they do answer this question in the affirmative that, yes, Christians and Muslims do in fact worship the same God. Now, you know, there are some uh, traditional Catholics who are suspicious of anything that comes out of the Second Vatican Council that will look askance at that. But if you look at the history of Christians dealing with Islam, you'll find that there is no unified answer to this question. There have historically been Christians who answer this question in the affirmative, and there are Christians who answer this question in the negative. So when Vatican II answers this question in the affirmative, it's not 
inventing a whole new understanding from thin air. It's taking one um, stream of thought uh, within the prior Christian tradition, and it is coming down on the side of that stream of thought. And I think that, you know, if the church has decided to say that this is the stream of thought that we're going to endorse, I'm going to give my assent to that, and I'm not going to quarrel with it. Gentlemen, I want to thank you both for coming on. This was a very, very interesting discussion. If y'all want to do another one, just let me know. Uh, willing to do it anytime. I've appreciated the spirit in which both of y'all have engaged here. So uh, once again, welcome to do it anytime on any uh, you know Christian Muslim topic that y'all want to engage. So, Louis, thank you for coming on. Dr. Andani, thank you once again. Take care. Thank you. And everybody in the audience, thank you for engaging uh, there in the chat. Thank you for your questions. Sorry if we didn't get to all of them. We're running out of time here. But uh, once again, thank you for your participation. If you would like to support us, check us out at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. Until next time, God bless you all. Mm.